Welcome to 33 minutes <laughs> worth of a two hour lecture um, on test driven development. So let's get right into it. Um, are you my intended audience? I believe you are because you are developers and or QA engineers, right? You like testing apps and you also like writing code. Um, you have may have heard of unit testing before, but you're not quite sure how it works or maybe you think it's too hard. Um, and you generally want to learn about more, more about automated testing <coughs> and what options we have. Um, and also just want to know the case for test-driven development. I mean, tests are good, but that doesn't mean that test-driven development is good. And so I'm going to cover both aspects. In fact, many more aspects of that. Um, and if we have time, we're going to get into a lot of little tips and tricks and gotchas and how-tos. And feel free to ask questions. Um, let me just start off with basic techniques. The core mantra of test-driven development is what we like to call the circle of life, Hakuna Matata, red-green refactor. What that means is that the very first thing you do when you want to write a piece of code is you first describe how that code should work. You don't just sit down and write it. It's a mental exercise that you go through. You write a test for that code even though that code doesn't exist. Okay, And that's the red phase, where you write a test, run it, and watch it fail, and actually make sure it's failing correctly. It's actually pretty easy to write a test that just fails, but it's not failing for the right reason. So that's yet another like mental exercise. You have to get good at that. Um, testing is hard, right? It's, it's a whole different way of thinking, especially if you're used to just programming by like sitting down and writing code until you're done which is a great way to learn how to code, but this is a good way to continue to code. Okay, so first you write a test, watch it fail, make sure it's failing for the right reasons. Then you write just enough code to make that one test pass. And that's the green phase. So usually the green phase stays red for a while, right? Red means when you run the tests, the result is in red because that's the warning color, right? The danger color. And then as soon as the test passes, it turns green. Um, then when you um, get it to be green, you smile and maybe take a deep breath and you turn to your pairing partner and give a high five and you enjoy the green. This is fun, but it's also there's a nefarious reason for it. I want you guys to get addicted to green because it really helps. You go from one little victory to another. It totally keys into the dopaminergic reinforcement system. Um, and then look at your code and also look at your tests before you go and start to write the next test. Figure out if there's any way to clean up the code. That's called refactoring. So cleaning up the code, refactoring, is changing the design of the code without changing its functionality. That's a pure refactoring. Sometimes you do a refactoring where you're actually adding a feature at the same time. But a pure refactoring is just changing the way it looks without changing what it does. And then you loop. So red, green, refactor, repeat. So another way of saying this is make it green, then make it clean, right? And it's the making it clean part that actually, it's arguably more important than having tests, is having clean code, right? If you just have code, then all you have is code that works today. You don't have any idea if it's going to work tomorrow. You don't have any idea if the next person to join your team is going to understand it. You don't know if it's going to be easy to debug if there's actually, you know, horror of horrors, a bug, like something you didn't consider, maybe adding a new feature. So the twin pillars of tests and cleanliness, right? Readable code and tested code, that allows the code to be maintainable. And yes, it's more work up front, but it pays off over the long term. So yeah, like I said, you want to get addicted to green. You want to get a little rush of pleasure every time a new test passes. The steady incremental feeling of progress is not an illusion. It, it's real. <laughs> you're, sort of, you're sort of attaching your brain to the code in a, in a very real way, right? You're, you're, feeling, you're feeling the code moving forward rather than just getting frustrated, 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 and then, okay, it's done. I'm going to go away. And that's another thing. If you, if you spend time doing the refactoring, you get to spend time with the code you just wrote. It's sort of like a little member of your family, and you want to get to know it better and then maybe make it better. The traditional way of writing code is you just write code all day. And then like maybe you test it 
like by firing up a web browser and clicking on some stuff. Um, in fact, when I was in college, you know, decades ago, the traditional way of writing code was you would get an assignment, you would spend a day, maybe two, writing code and getting it to compile. And then you would fix all the compile errors. That would be like day two. And then you would run it <laughs> on day three. It's ridiculous now thinking of that as like the right way to write code. It, it, it feels like punch cards, you know, but now that we have fast computers, now that we have text editors and, and, you know, command line tools and everything else, you can write code one little bit at a time, red, green refactor. Um, how do you write a good test? The structure of a test is basically set up preconditions, do something, and then assert post conditions. So you're kind of telling a story, right? You're saying once upon a time, that's the arrange part, right? Setting up the preconditions. Something happened. That's the doing the thing. That's the, that's the important part. That's the thing that drives the actual code. That's the thing that if that code hasn't been written, it's just going to fail right there. And then, and they all lived happily ever after, that's asserting the post conditions, right? You're saying after this little thing happened, what should now be true that was not true before? All right, so that's a post condition, otherwise known as an assertion. If you're using RSpec or another BDD framework, it's called a should, which is kind of an awkward way to say it. A lot of people still say asserts rather than, sh even though the word is, is should, it's still an assertion. So that assertion is the heart of a test. It's what makes a test a test. And it's very easy, actually, as as Ash saw yesterday, it's very easy to write a test and then forget the assert. And you're like, oh, good, the test passed. Mm -hmm. And you move on. And you're like, no, wait, there was no assert. I mean, he and I did that just yesterday, right? It was fun. Um, so uh, an assertion is a statement of how the world should be. It's a statement of truth, but it might actually not be true. Uh, another name for this is a predicate, right? Is a, a statement that can either be true or false. And the right way to think about it is it's a should statement. It's an expression of, it's an aspirational statement. I would really like it if this were true, right? So if I have a calculator, I tell the calculator to add two and two, and I say the result should be four. If it's not four, we have a problem, okay? Um, and so this is an example. Let's say that we're building a set, which is a standard collection class. Um, this is in Java, by the way. I think this is actually JavaScript, too, by the way, as it happens. But um, here we're creating a new set. This is the once upon a time, right? Once upon a time, I had a set. Then I added ice cream to the set. After that, the set should contain ice cream. And we all live happily ever after and eat the ice cream, right? I mean, it's okay. The happily ever after part isn't really working, is it? But um, right. So this is this assert true is. Uh, JUnit syntax, um, also known as XUnit, because that X can stand for any language, pretty much. It started off with SUnit in Smalltalk, and pretty much every other language now has a XUnit framework. So like for Objective-C, it's called OCUnit. For Java, it's called JUnit. For JavaScript, it's called JSUnit. And they all kind of mirror each other, where they have this assert true call that asserts that the thing in here returns true. Um, RSpec and other BDD frameworks don't use the word assert, they use the word should. The structure is the same, but the details are different. When you're doing an assertion in RSpec or whatever, Jasmine, any other BDD framework, you say set dot contains ice cream dot should be true. So you're putting the should at the, at the end, you're kind of making it sound a little more like an English language sentence rather than a line of code. Question? Can you, can you step through the code once more, sort of like word by word? Because this is mm -hmm. I've never really seen a test before. Really weird words for me. Uh huh. Like why does set set and set this? And well, this is just Java syntax here. I don't want to dwell too oh, much on the language. Java, right? It's not really. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is not about tests. This is just Java. The only thing about in here that's testy yeah. is this. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this is just how you make a new object in Java. Okay. You Java is more verbose than Ruby. So you have to say, instead of just saying set equals my set dot new, mm -hmm. you have to say capital S set set, that's telling the type of the variable. Yeah. And then you have to say 
open print, close print, semicolon, because mm -hmm. Java wants you to just type more. That's why Java is a strongly typed language, because mm -hmm. you have to be strong in order to type all those punctuation marks. Yeah. Okay, that was a joke. Everybody laugh. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. So uh, we will actually be test driving an object, probably a set, in a few minutes. Okay. So that'll be nice. Yeah, like you'll be able to see that. We will test drive an object. I promise. Yeah. I just want to start off with a few like, what are we doing? You know, why are we doing this? Rather than just jumping in and doing it. Right. So, it's very important not to be over ambitious. Mm -hmm. Don't try to assert too much in a single test. Don't try to add too many features in a single step. Mm -hmm. Think about the smallest possible feature. This is actually kind of a lean startup idea. What is the minimum viable product for this object? or for this method, right? So when you're, let, let's imagine the calculator again. The minimum test for a calculator would be that when I turn the calculator on, the result is zero. I'm not even gonna ask it to add or multiply anything, right? I'm just asking it, what are you? You are zero, great. Then I wanna add zero to that and assert that it's still zero, right? And this is, this is something that, um, so, so there are lots of reasons for this, and. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to jump too far ahead in my train of thought. But okay, th I think this is the right time to say this. I might have a slide on it later, but let me just tell you this idea now because it's actually really. It's probably the most important thing about why we test. When you're writing tests, you're describing the way the code should work, and you're building a structure around the code that really is more important than the code itself. You're building a functional specification for the code. You're building a live specification, which makes automated tests so much better than a design document. Because this is a design document that makes sure that it's correct every time you run all the run your test suite, every time you, you know, check in if you have a continuous integration system. It just keeps on running. So when you think of test driven development, your goal is not really to write the code. Your goal is to write the specifications for the code. And you want to be careful not to underspecify, right? You, you want to make sure that every little thing the code does is actually in the specs because the way that development works on a team, especially in a fast-paced startup kind of environment, is that people are changing the code all the time. And so you want to make sure that the spec still assures that given that they are, they're changing stuff, that when they change it, the old stuff doesn't break, right? When they add a new feature or fix a bug, it's very easy for you to focus on the new thing you added and very easy to forget about the old thing that you added six months ago. And the tests are there to make sure that that's still there. So that's why you have to be kind of careful and incremental about it because it's really easy when you're writing code to just go into the code and say, oh, I'll just put a little if statement in there and then run the tests and they pass and you forgot, oh, I didn't have a check for what if that if statement is false. Right? I, I forgot, I added some logic to the code and I forgot to add a test for that logic. So you wanna be careful. There is a line, and I'll get into that later, where like you can add code and it's stupid to write a test for the code you added. <laughs> I don't wanna say like every single token that you add or every single line of code needs a test. Some of them don't, but you have to think about it. Um, I like, I like the, the image of adding a brick to a wall, right? One brick at a time is how you build a wall. Right, and you have to think about it. You put the brick in and you know, lay, lay down the mortar and put the brick in and let it dry and then go on to the next one. Okay, maybe you let it dry later, but bad metaphor. But another way of thinking about it is a scaffold. When you're building a building, first you build a scaffold around the building and then you build the building. And in a unit test driven world, you leave the scaffold up. The scaffold is sort of making sure that the building is still standing <laughs> at all the points. So I mentioned this a minute ago. If you don't know where to start, a great place to start is at zero. This is called the null test. So for the calculator, like I said, the first test of a calculator would not be two plus two equals four. The first test of the calculator would be zero, right? Like when you turn it on, it's zero. Or maybe your calculator has a different concept. Maybe it's null, right, instead of zero or whatever it is. And just thinking about that, like, hey, what should the state of the world be when you turn it on helps you solve problems. Because now you get to think, wait a second, is zero the same thing as nothing in my little world? I don't know yet. Let's make that decision. Let's make it explicit. Let's put it in the tests. All right? So it helps you think about the interface. This is one of the, 
I don't want to say side benefits. It's one of the benefits of unit testing and especially of test-driven development is that it forces you to use the code that you're writing, which forces you to make the code usable. It's really easy to write unusable code. But if you have a test, then you've proved that it's useful and usable, well, maybe not useful, but you've proved that it's usable because you've used it, right? And so the null test, everything in object-oriented programming, the first thing you do with an object is construct it. So why don't you just construct it in your test and then assert some things about how it should be when it's new. Um, another good idea, when you're designing an object, usually you have all these grand plans for it. And I'm saying object, but it could just be a program. You have all these grand plans for it, but you have to be sensible, you have to be a project manager, you have to write a list of to-do items and then do them one at a time. So one of the things that you can do, as, and this is really good if you're pair programming, you keep a list on a piece of paper so that while one person is focusing on writing a feature, another person is thinking of new features or new tests for that feature and writing them down on the test list. And so the navigator is like, the project manager at that point is like looking at the to-do list. But you should, list, you should build the list together if you're sitting down to, to write a feature in the first place. You don't even need to add just tests to the test list. You can also add refactorings and features and whatever else. It's just like there to remind you. And usually when you're done with a session, you just tear up the list. It's not like you don't have to like add everything to Pivotal Tracker. It's just a guide for, for you. Um, so this last bullet point here is something that um, a lot of people, when they hear about test-driven development, they think that the way that works is you write a whole bunch of tests, like write a full test file, and then you try to write enough code to make them all pass. That's an okay way of doing it, but it's not great because of what I said before. Um, one thing is that you haven't really thought through the interface yet, and if you do it one step at a time, it gives you your subconscious more time to figure out what the interface should be rather than just deciding this is what the interface should be and here's all the ways that it should work because that could box you in. It might not be the best way. Might, the methods might not have the right names. The methods might not have the right parameters. Maybe it shouldn't be methods at all. Maybe it should be a block that you pass into the constructor. I mean, that kind of thing. So if you write, if, the, if you're sort of more incremental about it, then it makes the code better. Um, Here's another trick when you're starting off tests. Fake it till you make it. So the null test is a good way to start off. Fake it till you make it means that if you're, re remember that you're designing the specifications. You're not really designing the code, at least at first. So if you are de developing a calculator and you want to assert that the very first thing that the calculator does, you know, the result is zero, it's perfectly fine to hard code that zero and just have a method in your calculator, you know, def result return zero. And that'll make the first test pass and that's fine. Soon enough, you will realize because of the tests, you will be forced to make that zero into a variable or maybe it's a list and you have to do a calculation on it or something, you're gonna have to make it real soon. I don't even wanna say sooner or later, it's usually sooner. But while you're first starting off, you want to specify. And so then when you do make the code fancy, you realize you're not breaking the old stuff, the stuff that worked already when you were hard coding it. Um, one thing that, um, that people think, that people say when they hear this, one criticism of fake it till you make it is, oh, well, in that case, can't I just make a whole bunch of big if statements and just tailor my, my code directly to the test? and just always hard code every value, and then all the tests would be passing, but the code still wouldn't work. And the answer to that is, you forgot about the refactoring phase. Chances are that the real code is actually going to be cleaner and more concise than a whole bunch of big if statements, right? So you have to push it, right? If you do, the, if you do it right, you're not, you're not, if you try, if you're not trying to cheat, it'll work, <laughs> is basically what I'm saying. Um, another trick if you're stuck on how to write a test is start at the end. Start with the assertion and then figure out what would have needed to be done to make that assertion come out true. Right? So going to the set example, if I 
I'm, I'm like, well, I want to assert something about adding to a set, but I'm not really sure what the interface should be. Start with asserting that the set contains the thing. Assert that the set contains cake. And then back up and say set.addcake, right? That's what you need to do for that thing to get in the set. And then, oh, right, what set? The new set. So you would sort of be writing it bottom to top rather than top to bottom. And again, this is not required. It's just a way of getting you into the test if you're stuck. Um, okay, I think I said fake it till you make it twice now. Okay. Um, and another thing, this goes with what I said before, like if, you're, if you find yourself writing code that you know is stupid, don't write it. And write, you can write some tests for the good code, but then at a certain point, you're going to want to refactor to the algorithm you know it needs. If it's a complicated algorithm, you're going to need a complicated algorithm. Just don't jump to that. Try writing some tests, try driving the algorithm through the tests, and at the very least, you're going to get some good cases that it might turn out that your great, fancy, beautiful, perfect algorithm didn't actually handle, right? Because a lot of the time we think we're smarter than we really are. That's one of the, one of the problems that we have of being programmers, is that we are smart and we're often right, but not always. Um, and this line here is that, is being honest with yourself. If you thought that you knew how to write the thing and you wrote it without tests, that's fine, but just pay attention for every bug that comes out of that code that you wrote before you wrote, after, you know, before you wrote the tests and think of everything that you might have caught if you had had a test first and then just try to be honest with yourself. Um, off by one errors are the bane of all programmers. Right, and that's one of the things that tests are great at, is like catching those things. Because your nice algorithmic brain, if you have an awesome, you thought of a great new sorting algorithm, it's really easy for you to just insert an off by one error in there and it'll, it'll be wrong, but it won't look wrong. And so the test will prove that it's actually right. Um, okay, let's, um, let's test drive a class. Sound good? Sound good. Okay, so I'm gonna be on camera right now. Um, Okay, Abby, you ready? Okay, Abby, high five. Yay!